The student got off the bus and disappeared without a trace. She disappeared, and the next day her body was found. The police spent 39 years searching for the culprit, and it wasn't until 2019 that modern technology made it possible to uncover the truth. In this video, we'll tell you what happened to Helen Prashinsky. Helen Prashinsky was born on April 6, 1958, in the town of Huntington, which is near New York. She was the youngest of three children. Her brother and sister were 12 and 9 years old, respectively. The girl grew up in love and care, got along very well with her older relatives, and was a positive and bright person. When she was 14 years old, her father received a job offer, and the family had to move to the small town of Hamilton, near Boston, where she attended the local high school. There she got involved in singing and sports. At the same time, Helen decided that she wanted to pursue journalism as her future career. After high school, she enrolled at Wheaton College, located about 100 miles from her town. It was also close enough to visit her family, and the school offered a really good journalism education. She quickly adjusted to student life, excelled in school, and actively participated in college activities. Eventually, she got the internship she had been looking forward to, working in the newsroom of a radio station in Denver. Although the city was more than 2,000 miles away from her college, Helen was excited about the opportunity. Her aunt and uncle lived in Denver and agreed to let her stay with them during the internship. She also traveled with a classmate of hers who was a journalism student at the same college. In January 1980, Helen, who was 21 years old at the time, flew to Denver and started working at the radio station. She had to take a bus from the office to her home, which took about 30 minutes, and then she had to walk a few kilometers on foot. On January 16, as usual, she left the radio station at 6 o'clock p.m. and went to the bus stop. However, she didn't show up at home. Her aunt immediately became worried because in the past, Helen had always informed her that she planned to be out late. The woman waited for several hours, but at half past 11 o'clock, she decided to go to the police after all. Investigators immediately began the search fearing that her disappearance may be connected to a recent string of attacks on women in the area. They calmed the area along Helen's route all night, but were unable to find her. In the morning, a woman driving her car through a suburban area of Denver with her children contacted the police. At some point, they noticed someone lying in a field near the road. The mother stopped the car, came closer, and saw the lifeless body of a young girl. The police arrived on the scene and Helen was immediately identified. Some of her clothes were missing, her hands were tied behind her back, and all of her personal belongings were gone. Later, medical experts determined that the girl had been stabbed nine times and had also been subjected to abuse. The death occurred between 8 o'clock p.m. and 10 o'clock p.m. Police were able to locate a witness who saw Helen get off the bus at approximately 5.30 p.m. from the bus stop. She would have walked several miles, and apparently, the perpetrator attacked her somewhere along the way. Law enforcement authorities searched the area near where the body was found, but they were unable to find any leads other than a pair of boot prints believed to be from a size 44 shoe, which led from the road to the body and back. By that time, Medical examiners had found biological material on the victim's body and clothing, but in those years, DNA research was in its infancy and couldn't help the investigation. However, these samples were sent to the lab for safekeeping, hoping that in the future, they could help pinpoint the perpetrator. The police turned to the public for information, using newspapers and local television to find witnesses who might have seen Helen that night. They were soon approached by a woman who claimed that around 10.20 p.m., she saw a man near the field where the body was found. He was standing on the side of the road next to a car. Unfortunately, it was dark at the time, and the woman couldn't get a good look at him. She provided the police with only general features, which were not of much help. The detectives then took an interesting step. With the witness's consent, they invited a hypnotist to the station, and the woman was able to remember more details. From her recollection, they were able to create a portrait of the unknown man. It is difficult to say whether the hypnosis session helped the investigation, but the fact remains that at that time, the police had nothing but this drawing. However, they were never able to find any suspects, 
and the case remained unsolved for years. Six months later, Helen was posthumously awarded her college diploma as a mark of remembrance. In addition, the institution's governing body established an alumni award named after her, given for active participation in college life, which was a characteristic of Helen throughout her studies. The investigation wasn't reopened until 1998, 18 years after the murder. At that point, advancements in DNA research technology had been made. Researchers began in putting samples of biological material into the FBI database. Unfortunately, no matches were found, indicating that the perpetrator had no prior criminal record, at least since the database included convicted individuals. Another 15 years passed, and in 2013, the local police department established a unit to focus on unsolved cases. They reopened the investigation into Helen's murder, but were unable to find any new leads. The DNA sample from the victim's body never showed up in the FBI database. That meant the girl's killer had evaded the police's attention the entire time. Over the years, not only the police and Helen's relatives, but also the girl's high school friends, who were in the choir with her, tirelessly sought the truth. Decades after her murder, they continued to urge the detectives to regularly review the case. They also gave interviews to raise awareness among the public and distributed flyers with information about Helen's murder along the bus route. In 2017, the case was reopened once again, and this time, the detectives had more opportunities. Forensics had started extensively using genetic genealogy, a complex and time-consuming process by which the perpetrator's identity can be determined through their relatives. However, this method only works if the relatives of the DNA holder are present in publicly available genetic databases primarily used for searching family members. In 2018, the police submitted the available DNA samples to a lab, such as Drum's Lab, which had already assisted in solving hundreds of similar cases. The experts had to examine around 3,000 potential matches, including even the most distant relatives of the alleged perpetrator. They had to screen out those who didn't fit the age or who couldn't have committed the crime for various reasons. Eventually, the experts determined that the DNA owner had a high probability of being the son of a woman named June Estes, who had passed away. The challenge was that she had four sons, but the lab could only identify two of them. The two identified sons were 10 and 11 years old at the time of the murder, so they were excluded as suspects. The search for the other two sons continued, and the experts began exploring alternative options. After another year, something unexpected happened. A woman named Jessie submitted her DNA sample into a public database, which was the primary tool for identifying criminals. The experts at Paragon immediately noticed that Jessie was a fairly close relative of Helen's killer and contacted her. The DNA was thoroughly examined, and it was determined that the killer was Jessie's second cousin. The detectives asked Jesse to provide information about her family to finally identify the suspect. Luckily, Jesse was interested in podcasts about various crimes, including Helen's murder. That's why she uploaded her data into the public database, because she knew that genetic genealogy could help find a person through even distant relatives. Jesse had hoped her decision could help solve a case, although she couldn't imagine it would happen so quickly after uploading her data. Jessie began collecting information on her family tree and asked both of her parents to add their DNA to the database. Through this process, the experts at Paragon determined that the killer was related to Jessie on her paternal line. Unfortunately, the search for answers continued for several more months. The experts, detectives, and Jessie's family worked together to uncover more information about the owner of the DNA found at the murder scene. Finally, a breakthrough occurred. The police were able to establish contact with a relative of June Estes, who provided new details about her older sons. It was discovered that June had struggled with mental health issues, and after a breakdown, the father took the boys to another town. The names of the boys were William and Curtis, and the detectives had to determine which of them was the murderer. The answer didn't take long to emerge. The police quickly discovered that William had been incarcerated on several occasions, and his DNA sample had been entered into the FBI database in 2010. Considering that, the sample from Helen's body had been compared against that database multiple times since then. The downside of that database is that it only shows full matches, not partial matches. Even when dealing with brothers, 
it can be a limitation. 39 years after the murder, the police had a prime suspect, Curtis White, who also used the last name Clinton. It turned out that Curtis had a long criminal history. At the age of 18, he knocked on a woman's door and asked to use her phone. Once inside, he grabbed a knife and subjected the victim to rape before fleeing. He was quickly apprehended and sentenced to 30 years in prison. However, he was released after just four years due to the intervention of a staff member at a Christian institution for troubled teens, where Curtis had been before reaching adulthood, for a grand theft auto charge. This person was willing to take Curtis into their home and help him find employment. It's difficult to imagine inviting a convicted felon into your home with your wife and five children, but this individual asked the court to release Curtis on those terms. Upon his release, Curtis moved in with this person and found work as a gardener. At the time of Helen's murder, he was living in that area. He later relocated to Florida, where detectives traveled to in 2019. Curtis was 62 years old at the time and worked as a truck driver. Before charging him with Helen's murder, investigators wanted more tangible evidence. They had been surveilling Curtis for about a week, attempting to discreetly obtain a sample of his DNA. Initially, they retrieved a milk carton from his dumpster and sent it to the lab. Forensics found DNA on it, but there wasn't enough for proper analysis. On November 30, detectives followed Curtis to a bar where he consumed several bottles of beer from the same glass. As soon as he left, they seized the glass and sent it to a laboratory in Colorado. The transportation and examination took almost a month, but eventually the detectives had the long-awaited result in their hands. The sample from the victim's body was a perfect match to Curtis's DNA. He was arrested on December 11 and charged with Helen's murder. Initially, the man denied any involvement in the case, so the prosecutor began preparing for trial and Curtis himself was extradited to Colorado. However, something unexpected happened during the journey to Colorado. Gradually, Curtis began to confess to his actions. The detectives accompanying him listened to all the details of the crime. Curtis admitted that he was driving down the street when he noticed a lonely girl getting off the bus. He pulled out a knife, forced her into his car, and intended to commit violent acts. He then drove her out of town, where he subjected her to abuse and ultimately murdered her. As a result, Curtis was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Considering that he would be 82 years old at that point, it is uncertain whether he will live to see that day. Unfortunately, most of Helen's immediate family members did not live to see justice served. Her parents and older brother had passed away years before Curtis's confession. The only surviving family member is her older sister. Almost 40 years later, the elderly woman received a call from the police station, finally providing her with information about this entire story. There is still one chilling aspect left. As you may recall, during the time of Helen's murder in Denver, there were repeated incidents of violence against women with a common modus operandi. Detectives suspect that Curtis may have been responsible for these crimes as well, but they can no longer prove it. Please share your thoughts on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video.